Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. Uh, thank you, Japan Society, for this lovely venue. It's not always that we get to do events on international affairs in New York City in an auditorium this beautiful. Um, and thank you, the Young China Watchers, and, for Vicky, and to Vicky for that a wonderful introduction. Um, so I have the pleasure today of introducing someone that really needs no introduction. Um, we're all very fortunate here uh, to be here today with uh, Dr. Sheila Smith, who is this country's um, foremost expert on issues related to Japan, the Japan-U.S. alliance, um, and Asian security issues in general. Um, I know when I'm writing about Asian security or Japanese issues, I always uh, Google Sheila's name next to the topic that I'm thinking of writing about just to see if Sheila's written something about it, because I often find myself learning quite a bit from her uh, impressive record of past writings. Um, so Sheila is currently a senior fellow at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, where she works on Japan. Um, she is the author of Japan Rearmed, the book we're here tonight to discuss, and of Intimate Rivals, Japanese Domestic Politics in the Rising China, which was published a few years ago in 2015. Um, Sheila has um, also been the author of a CFR interactive guide on constitutional change in Japan. She is a regular contributor to the CFR blog, Asia Unbound, and a frequent contributor to major uh, media outlets in the United States and Asia. She joined CFR from the East-West Center in 2007, where she directed a multinational research team in a cross-national study of the domestic politics of the U.S. military presence in Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines. She was a visiting scholar before that at Keio University, where she researched Japan's foreign policy towards China. She's additionally been a visiting researcher at two leading Japanese foreign and security policy think tanks, the Japan, International, the Japan Institute of International Affairs and the Research Institute for Peace and Security, and at the University of Tokyo and at the University of the Ryukyus. Um, Sheila is a vice chair of the U.S. Advisors to the U.S.-Japan Conference on Cultural and Educational Interchange. And additionally, she, has, um, she is an adjunct professor in the Asian Studies Department at Georgetown University. So I invite everybody now to uh, welcome Sheila Smith uh, to the stage where she will speak briefly on her new book, Japan Rearmed. Thank you. Thank you, Anki, for that lovely introduction. Um, I am delighted to be back at the Japan Society. Many of you may know that I was a graduate student here in New York uh, at Columbia University. And the Japan Society was where we hung out and got to be adults in the Japan world. Uh, we came to see films here. We came to see programs like this. We, 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 we saw the Japan Society as a home away from home in a way where we got to be Japan professionals, not just students or graduate students, but actually to talk to others who were accomplished and who had developed careers in the field. So I'm delighted to be here. And as Ankit said, it's a beautiful place. Very bright lights, but very beautiful room. Um, I can't see any of you, just so you know. If I have friends in the audience, you're behind a big, big light. Um, but thank you all for coming out. This is a lovely audience, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I want to also thank um, the Young China Watchers, and Vicky in particular, who invited me months ago uh, to come and talk to her group. And I was delighted to have the chance to meet the, young, the next generation of movers and shakers in the China world. So thank you for that. And of course, Tomoko always uh, makes me feel welcome when I come here. It's been too long, uh, but I'm delighted to be back. So I have a new book. Um, it's a book that takes me back also, uh, because it's a book that I began to think about when I was a graduate student at Columbia, writing my dissertation. And I was looking at a country that had embedded in its constitution an article, Article 9, that basically said it would not treat military force or military power in the same way that other countries did or took for granted. Right? It said in its constitution that Japan, the Japanese people, uh, would forever renounce right, war as a means of settling international disputes. Uh, I, as a graduate student, thought that was a remarkable thing. Uh, I kind of wished our constitution said something like that, too. Um, not because I was a pacifist, needless to say, but because it seemed so obvious that that would be a smart thing to do, right? Um, but the real question that I wanted to research uh, in my dissertation was, so how does that square with being uh, one of the principal allies of a nuclear superpower in the post-war era? How does that square with what we then thought of as the defining configuration of international politics, which was the Cold War. I was a grad, grad student at the end of the Cold War. It seems like a very long time ago. <laughs> but it was in the fr that frame that I went to graduate classes taught by Bob Jervis and other theorists of international relations up at Columbia. 
And the Cold War framing, I mean, every security class was about NATO. Every security class focused on extended deterrence and NATO. Not one focused on Asia. Of course, I was a contemporary of people like Victor Cha. You now know Tom Christensen, who's now up here at SIPA. Uh, our generation thought, why aren't we talking about this in Asia? Why aren't we talking about the pressures, not only of extended deterrence and alliances, but why aren't we talking about security in the Asia Pacific? Why are we so myopically focused on Europe? Well, of course, it was the Cold War, and that's what we did in policy terms as much as in, in theoretical terms. So I think our generation came along and said, hold on a second. The dynamics of the Cold War play out differently in Asia. They always, they, they, the two hot wars of the Cold War uh, were in Asia. Uh, and our allies in Asia feel the divisions of Europe that, that Europeans faced into east and west on the north and south in the Korean Peninsula. But Japan felt it also, just offshore uh, of China and obviously of, of the Soviet Union at the time. We've come a long way since then. Japan was very resistant to seeing its own military as playing a considerable role in that Cold War. It did, however, see great advantage to offering bases and facilities to the United States, which forward deployed its forces in the region. And the self-defense forces gradually developed their capability and their sense of mission and their sense of perhaps what kind of contingency might motivate the need for them to defend their country under that framing of the Cold War. The Korean Peninsula, from the very beginning, from the Korean War, was the defining possibility um, that might bring war to the shores of Japan. It, has, it was then in 1950. It remains that way today. It is the most likely place where armed force could be used in Asia, and it therefore becomes the most likely way in which Japan would, would become embroiled in a war. Now, that doesn't mean that all of the self-defense forces thought about what they would do in a Korean contingency. It took a long time in Japan for the kinds of things we take for granted if you sit in Washington, I suspect if you sit in Beijing, um, but things like contingency planning or talking about what, what are you going to do if the worst case scenario kind of thinking that's really the job of our militaries and our, our departments of defense. Um, it took a long time for that to be legitimate in post-war Japan. Uh, in, the, in the book I just wrote, I have one chapter that's all about the Cold War, and I talk a little bit about that divorce, really, between military and civilian authority over security planning that was very much a part of the early decades of Japan's thinking um, in the, in the post-war period. But things changed after the Cold War ended. And so the book that I just wrote, my, my dissertation and some of the research of that period is in that second chapter, the background chapter. <laughs> but the bulk of the book is really about the way in which different kinds of realities and pressures and thinking shaped uh, what I think is a pretty significant transformation in Tokyo of how Japanese planners, but also the public, sees the utility of their military um, in, in the post-Cold War era. So the book is really dated from the end of the Cold War. Uh, it has, it's structured with different ways in which this debate has played out and for different reasons. And I won't tell you all, the, all of it because that'll be boring and then you won't want to buy the book if you don't, haven't read it yet. Um, but I do walk through one of the early pieces uh, that I, are, is so fundamental and hopefully Anki and I can talk about this later um, in the context of what's happening today. Um, and that is sending the self-defense forces abroad, sending Japan's military out of the country. And of course, it was done in coalition with other partners, with the United States, uh, with the United Nations for peacekeeping operations. Um, but the end of the Cold War really brought the self-defense forces more clearly into the forefront of Japanese national thinking about its role in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that the Japanese military is mobilized and sent around the globe to attack people, right? It is not the framing that, 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 that even Mr. Abe, who many people see as being quite forthright in terms of how he looks at the Japanese military. Very few people in Japan see that role for their military. What they do see, though, is a role that the self-defense forces can play in conjunction with other partners to help address some of the global challenges to security. So you saw them first and foremost in the UN, out in Cambodia. Uh, many people here, uh, especially for those of you who have UN experience, know that uh, that mission, 
uh, the UNCTAC mission, uh, was led by a very well-known UN diplomat who was Japanese, Mr. Akashi. And so it was, a, it was a comfortable framing for the very first effort to send the self-defense forces abroad to help alongside others around the globe, uh, help Cambodia move into a post-conflict peaceful transition, right? That was the very beginning of the self-defense forces uh, story under the PKO law of 1991. But today, the self-defense forces operate across Asia, across the globe, in fact, sometimes in PKOs, sometimes in humanitarian or disaster relief, sometimes unilaterally. Uh, they participated in uh, the United States' response to 9-11. They did refueling operations in the Iraq War. Very contentious at home, but nonetheless, uh, that's what happened. They are today operating in the Gulf of Aden in the anti-piracy coalition organized by the United States, but with many other partners as well. It is the one place, for those of you who like these kinds of details, where the Japanese and Chinese militaries operate in relatively close proximity. They also, the self-defense forces today, at the behest of the prime minister, of course, operate in conjunction with the Australian military, with the Indian military. They visit the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Singapore, many of the places where we would think that war memory would preclude the Japanese from sending their military, but they do it in a capacity that's very different than the pre-war period. The Japanese today are helping the Filipino military, especially on maritime uh, capacity building. They're helping them make sure that they have the ability to defend their own waters. They have visited uh, Vietnam at the invitation of the Vietnamese government for similar reasons. They work very closely with Australia, all across the Western Pacific, uh, on intelligence gathering, surveillance, monitoring, all kinds of uh, uh, consultations now, of course, on the South China Sea. Uh, they are both maritime partners, uh, but they are very close uh, security partners of the United States as well. India, another very interesting story. Uh, the United States and India have been having exercises over the years called the Malabar exercises. Uh, we typically think of them as maritime exercises, but in fact, they now engage all three of India's branches of the military. Japan's three branches of the self-defense force, the maritime, air, and ground forces, now have a strategic conversation with their, uh, with their friends in Delhi. Uh, and the Malabar exercises are something the Japanese now are, have been organically built into. Right, as part of their efforts to increase their security and strategic uh, dialogue with India. So you have a very active self-defense force now in the region, places where you might not think that, that the Japanese military would be all that welcome. But in fact, the Japanese military today is one of the most accomplished militaries in Asia. And they are also very instrumental in making sure that other countries around the region feel that they can turn to Tokyo to help them if and when they get challenged by other growing larger parties uh, in the region. And of course, the maritime area is where we see that most conspicuously, but it's not exclusively uh, the place where, the, where I'm referring, obviously, to the Chinese here, but the, where the Chinese military operates in Southeast Asia. So Japan is, the Jap Japanese military today is, you know, four or five generations after the end of World War II is a very different military. Uh, it's very professional. And I think, you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, why, why did you put that cover on your book? <laughs> I would hold it up, but I don't have a copy. But it has a sort of provocative, there it is, <laughs> provocative cover. But more importantly, the picture aside, the title was something that I thought about a long, a long time because of my work at CFR. I live down in Washington, as you know. I spent a lot of time there, both under the Obama years and now under the Trump administration. And officials would come to me and still come to me to say, ooh, are the Japanese rearming? Are they going to build a military? And I thought, you know, we kind of have to put an end to this <laughs> somehow. And so the title of my book and the introductory chapter simply points out that Japan has had a significant military capability for decades. It's not rearming. Japan has been, one of, in terms of spending investment in military capability, Japan has invested considerably in its military capability, without a doubt, top 10. And that goes back to the 1980s. Today, it is somewhere around seven or eight, depending on you know how much China is spending at the moment. It slips back and forth. 
So it's ranking within that top 10, uh, maybe slightly different year to year. But there's no doubt about it that Japan has felt it necessary and important to invest in the military as an instrument, right, of statecraft. What's more interesting is not the remilitarizing of Japan, but the decision-making that Japan has engaged in in the last decade or more about how to use that military. So I've just walked through one of the chapters with you here about sending the forces abroad uh, in coalition with others. The more difficult issue for Japan, of course, has been defending and making sure their military is ready to defend should someone put pressure, threaten, coerce, or actually attack Japan. And I think that's the one place where you see a considerable change in Japan's environment. You see two neighbors, I'm thinking of North Korea and China here, who have themselves moved their arsenals into a, a position of uh, capability or increase their capability sufficient to be a threat to Japan. Now, that doesn't mean North Korea is about to attack the Japanese. It doesn't mean China wants to have a war with Japan. But both of those countries have invested considerably, both technologically and financially, in building rapidly military capabilities that undermine Japanese security. We saw the most recent uh, indication of that in 2017 when the North Koreans were sending the barrages of, of missiles over top of Japan. And then we're sending a larger test missile, one or two, uh, that could potentially reach the United States actually into Japanese airspace or over Japanese airspace. So the Japanese now look at North Korea, and of course they worry about the nuclear peace, obviously because that will be a test for all of our allies, especially our non-nuclear allies of South Korea and Japan. But for the Japanese, it's the missile arsenal that really lays bare the vulnerability of Japanese capability. Japan does not have yet a missile uh, arsenal of its own. In other words, it doesn't have the capacity, even a conventional capacity, uh, to strike its neighbors. It has very carefully avoided developing that kind of capability has stayed very much in defensive mode, reactive mode. But as, it, as the Japanese have watched the Koreans, the North Koreans develop this kind of capability and proliferate the number and the kind of missiles that, that Pyongyang has accrued over the last five to 10 years, it does raise what I call in the book a missile gap. It raises a question for the Japanese. Are they, continuing, are they going to continue to subscribe to this idea that they should not purchase a strike capability, that they should not do this? And this has been part of the political debate, and it's in the book. You can read it if you're interested. So politicians have debated this, as have people inside uh, the Ministry of Defense and inside the Self-Defense self Forces. Um, but that's a threshold the Japanese have yet to cross. And that's one way in which the threat perception of what North Korea has been doing since the mid-1990s has affected the Japanese thinking about their own defenses and what may be necessary. What Japan has done and done with deep investment is uh, engage in ballistic missile defense systems. And you just saw last year the Japanese government announced that it will expand the capacity of their ballistic missile defenses. Uh, to include an, include an onshore version, what they call the Aegis Ashore, which will give Japan a much greater capacity to detect, to track, and if necessary, to shoot down any missiles that are coming from continental Asia. So there's been a lot of spending on a defensive structure, force posture, to deal with the missile threat from North Korea and potentially, obviously, the missile threat from other p parties around Japan. The second area where Japan has seen its threat perception intensify, of course, has been China. And we saw that, we've seen that in terms of the modernization of Chinese nuclear forces. We saw the Japanese get very nervous in the mid-1990s about China's willingness to threaten uh, Taiwan, right, uh, with the potential of use of force during an election campaign, right? But the real challenge, of course, the real wake-up call, I think, for Japanese security planners and obviously for the U.S.-Japan alliance was the island dispute of 2010 and then again in 2012. Uh, the Senkaku, or Diaoyu, as the Chinese refer to it, these islands in the East China Sea, of course, are, have a very strong emotional uh, component, um, especially for the Chinese people, but also for the Japanese. And China and Japan have basically avoided a direct clash. They've sort of said, let's just leave those, our sovereignty issue on the sides. 
But by the mid-2010s, that was no longer possible, and you saw a ratcheting up of not government-to-government tensions, really, citizen-to-citizen tensions, protesters, demonstrations, fishing captains, right, having a few too many and deciding to take on the Japanese Coast Guard. But that then galvanized, I think, the political leadership in both countries to a point where they couldn't back down. So now you've got government forces on both sides, Coast Guards, not yet navies, uh, operating within the territorial waters of those islands, which for a long time basically were quietly managed by the two governments. Today, the Senkaku Island dispute doesn't drive Japanese defense planning, right? But it certainly opened up the possibility for the first time that Japan might be the recipient of some kind of pressure, military pressure from China, or some kind of military attack maybe on these remote islands before the United States was involved. And I talked a lot about Korea, the assumption about a a contingency on the Korean Peninsula during the Cold War and even after the Cold War was always that the United States would respond and that Japan would be either pulled in or want to support U.S. forces through the bases, but never somewhere where Japan would be attacked directly. In other words, that the initiation of the use of force or conflict would begin with Japan. But the Senkaku Island dispute in 2010 and 2012 began to raise the prospect that, oh, miscalculation, an accident, not deliberate necessarily, ambition for war, but that kind of escalatory dynamic, something we're seeing a little bit over there in the Middle East today, right? Um, That kind of ratcheting up of tensions could be very hard to manage and could have Japan at the front line of that level of tension. So the Japanese, of course, have responded with Washington to shore up the US-Japan alliance to make sure that the United States and Japan are on the same page in case something were to happen, and to try to figure out strategies for de-escalation, right, should there be that kind of crisis. But nonetheless, that challenge with China over the islands really did open the possibility that the United States may not want to go to war in China, that the United States may have different interests from Japan in a conflict such as that. That's what we call in IR theory the risk of abandonment, right? Our allies don't want to be entrapped by our conflicts, but they don't want to be abandoned by us if they have a need for us either. Um, So that that became a a fairly focused look at uh, Japanese security and political thinking about how do we make sure the United States and Japan are deeply embedded so that that possibility of abandonment is probably not going to happen. I think the, 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 those two scenarios, North Korea and China, clearly have had the biggest impact, not only in the way Japanese think about weapon systems and purchases, and we just saw a defense plan at the end of last year that sees a, a, an uptick in annual defense budget growth for the next five years, But they also have prompted a rethinking of the U.S.-Japan alliance and an upgrading, if you will, in the dialogue between the United States and Japan about how this alliance is going to work given this new Asia, given these new pressures. And the book also talks in in a chapter I call Relying on Borrowed Power um, from the Japanese perspective of why there is more attention being given today by Japanese political and security planners political leaders and security planners about how to make sure the United States remains engaged and that the conversation between the United States and Japan becomes more and more um, closer, I wouldn't say war to a war fighting kind of alliance because that's what we have with the ROK and that's what we had with NATO largely, still do, Um, but that we get a little bit more concrete about, well, what do we do should this happen? As you all may know, um, we've got 50,000 American Uh, military personnel stationed forward deployed in Japan. They operate the exercise with Japanese self-defense force partners every day. Uh, Our militaries know each other very, very well. But this is still an alliance where we don't always know how our political decisions will be made. And those are the ones that matter, right? Those are the ones that matter if you're in a crisis or you have to respond quickly to a crisis. The application of military force, of course, is at the level of the highest elected office in both of our democracies. Uh, And I think that's where you've had a greater sense of need for a conversation between the United States and Japan. 
uh, in the last decade or so, especially the last five years. So let me wrap up a little bit by giving you the, the two cents conclusion of the book. And I, I work at CFR. I'm not supposed to just be an academic. <laughs> I'm supposed to try to help policymakers understand what I think is coming next. And so when I, when I listen to American policymakers or I sit in Washington in these conversations, um, and again, I'm not a policymaker. I don't sit in classified settings. So all of the writing in this book is open source and based on my experience. It's not based on any classified data or anything like that. So, um, But when I do sit and have these conversations, and I was at CFR and in Washington through the, the Senkaku crisis, through the 2017 North Korea missile launches, et cetera, um, what I thought the book that needed to be written was, how does this work? What is the debate in Japan? And how does it help us and help our policy community understand what might be coming next. Of course, it also speaks to this question about is Japan going to change its fundamental post-war organization of military capability limited to, to national defense coupled with alliance with the United States? And my answer today is no, unless. And the unless is important here because I think a lot of people feel that this rising threat perception from North Korea and China will make Japan uh, change its mind on things like conventional strike. Some people think even on nuclear weapons. When I did the book launch uh, at, at, in New York at CFR, I can't tell you how many questions I got about Japanese nuclear capability and what the Japanese could do and would they do it and how would they do it. And Okay. <laughs> Take a breath. Japan is not about to become a nuclear power. Um, but threat perception, my conclusion is threat perception alone is not going to push Japanese political or security strategic thinkers away from that basic fundamental premise that limited capability, limited to the needs of national defense, and reliance on the US for extended deterrence, both nuclear deterrence but also conventional strike, is still the preferred method of ensuring Japanese security. And I think that's going to be true no matter what the Chinese or the North Koreans do. Where I think you will have a variable that will change Japanese thinking, that variable will be the United States. If the alliance is no longer reliable, if we decide, eh, Asia's not our thing, South Korea and Japan can go it alone. Why shouldn't they? If we decide that we're more interested in burden sharing than in a shared strategic relationship across Asia, if we decide to negotiate with North Korea and accept them as a nuclear power, it's, it's inevitable. These are the kinds of decisions that I think will prompt some rethinking in Japan about what that means for the long haul for Japanese security. At the end of the day, if there's a catastrophic failure of the alliance to defend Japanese interests and certainly to defend Japanese territory, then sure, I don't think the alliance is going to last beyond that. I don't think that's what any of us are thinking about, though. It's the more unclear areas of how secure will Japan's political and strategic thinkers feel in American reliability as an ally. Because Japan's military capability has largely been created to complement America's forward deployed forces and America's willingness to offer an extended deterrent. Should that willingness end, then yeah, you'll have a Japanese debate over what its options are. And I don't in the book try to give you four or five options that Japan may do, because I think that's a little premature. I don't think that's something that's going to happen overnight. And I don't think it's something that's going to happen just because we have a president in the White House at the moment who made some statements that make us a little worried about burden sharing. So this is not a phenomenon. When I conclude the book, I do reference the president uh, and his comments about our alliances. But I wanted, what I wanted to do in the book is end to help Americans understand that it's our alliance with Japan in the end that will be the most important shaper of Japanese strategic choices going forward. So thank you. So, she didn't have a copy of the book, but here it is. Um, I've been spending a lot of time with it recently, and I yeah. recommend it very much. Um, so when I was thinking about how I would begin our conversation at the Japan Society today, I thought maybe we do North Korea first, or the East China Sea, Senkaku Islands. Okay. Um, but then I woke up this morning, 
Yes. And um, I had to change plans because now we're going to talk about the Gulf of Oman. Yes. Uh, which is unexpected. Um, so what a twist to Prime Minister Abe's trip yeah. to Iran, historic trip to Iran. Um, a Japanese flagged vessel was hit by what appears to now be a mine that the U.S. government has attributed to Iran. Uh, unclear specifically which actors within the Iranian system. Um, but certainly this puts Japan uh, at the center of the U.S.-Iran uh, escalation that's been really going on for several months now. My question is, um, walk us through the conversations you think are happening right now in Tokyo. Um, I know you spend a lot of time with Japanese security planners, but what is going through their mind and what are the questions that they're asking themselves? So this was a quick breaking morning for all of us, I think. We were all trying to say, what, what, what? Now, I, I, may, I may be wrong because I was going on Twitter and I was going on trying to figure out what was happening in the region and um, trying to figure out time differences between Iran and Tokyo and <laughs> the East Coast of the United States. <laughs> Not where I normally think about it. It's out there in the, in the Middle East. But... Um, Two things. I think it was a Panamanian flagged ship. These are not ships that had the Japanese flag on them, but the company that was responsible for the cargo is a Japanese company. Now, I heard later today it was initially reported that there were two Japanese ships, but one actually may be a Taiwanese ship, but there is one ship, okay? Um, the, the president of the company came out and said, we don't know enough yet. Um, I think all of what I could see coming out of Tokyo, and I see some rather official looking people in the room, so they're probably better placed to comment on some of this than I am, um, is that we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, I find it hard to believe that this was something, our Secretary of State, of course, let me say this first, our Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, had a press conference this afternoon in which he seemed to imply it was the government of Iran that might be responsible. Um, and um, said it was a, a setback for Prime Minister Abe, right, to do this. I think we don't have enough information yet to understand. And I, I believe there are meetings happening either as we speak or into the night or early tomorrow morning, I don't know, um, still in the United Nations. Hopefully we'll get more evidence. We'll have some you know, factual information from which to judge the scenario. Um, but would Japan, you know, my book is all about, would Japan make choices about sending its military? Well, um, it is in the Gulf of Aden that there are there is a destroyer, right, in the CTF-151, which is a combined task force for anti-piracy operations that the Japanese are regular participants in. Um, I think it's the Asagiri is the destroyer that's out there at the moment. There's Japanese surveillance um, aircraft that are based out of Djibouti in support of that mission. So Japan does have assets in the region. Um, would Japan apply those assets? No. And there's two reasons I think that. I mean, would they do surveillance? Perhaps. Would that combined task force share data? Perhaps. But would Japan send its maritime self-defense force to confront Iranian or whoever you know ships? Probably not. And the reason I say that is twofold. The ships that were attacked, the people have been rescued. Right? So there are no people anymore on burning ships. So that would be the primary concern, I think, of Prime Minister Abe and the cabinet. Uh, and those people have been rescued. They were Filipino, I believe. Um, they were not Japanese nationals, to my understanding. Um, what I think is harder is, what does this mean for the mission that Prime Minister Abe went on, which is to help reduce tension, to offer his services as potentially a mediator between Iran uh, and the Trump administration here in the United States. Um, I suspect that Secretary of State Pompeo's speech comment today suggests that tensions ha will go up between Washington and Iran, not because Mr. Abe didn't get the job done, but because the cargo ships themselves offer an excuse or a rationale for greater tension. And there is, I think, the challenge for the Prime Minister, honestly. Um, now, what is MOD doing and what is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? There are people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the audience, so I won't presume to guess at what they are doing. Um, but the dip diplomatic mission was very important, I think, for Japan's interests. Nobody wants a, a conflict right, in, in the Middle East, especially along the oil routes that service the advanced industrial economies of, of the world. Right? And so if you watch the markets this afternoon, respond to the tankers, um, the bombing of the tankers, then yeah, 
this is going to shake up uh, not only the Japanese economy, but the global economy writ large. So my sense is, whatever the diplomacy ends up being inside the UN Security Council, Japan will want to avoid a conflagration uh, that has this kind of disruptive Im Im implications for the global economy and obviously for its own supply of oil. Absolutely. Um, so just changing gears a little bit, listening to you speak right now about Japan, uh, particularly thinking about conventional strike and acquiring its own missile forces, right. one of the topics that immediately came to mind was that on August 2nd, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty will no longer apply to the United States. The U.S. will have withdrawn, um, and we've heard reporting that the U.S. is going to develop now missiles. Uh, the treaty restricted the United States from developing ground-launched cruiser ballistic missiles with right. ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. And one of the places those theoretical missiles might be deployed is Asia, where these conversations will probably happen with Tokyo. Right. How? In your understanding, um, this is a recent development, right? The U.S. made the decision in February. We had right. some signs it was happening. What are the conversations that you think are happening in Tokyo about INF and the future of that? And how is that going to play in to the debate that you described on right. Japan thinking about conventional strike of its own? So let me try to unpack that because there's a lot in that yeah. question. <laughs> so, so let me give you – so the history of INF in Japan is something that maybe the audience doesn't – may not know, which is intermediate nuclear forces was largely seen as a European problem back when, right, during the Cold War. And that was because the Soviets had developed this SS-20 missile, they had deployed it uh, to, the, to the Eastern Europe, right, and Western Europe and the United States were worried about this would, you know, make it hard to manage escalation, right, and may decouple the Europeans from our extended deterrent, our nuclear uh, weapons. Um, so that's a little Cold War history. At the time, it was Prime Minister Nakasone who was Prime Minister in the 1980s. And at the uh, Williamsburg summit, he, the Japanese government, led by Prime Minister Nakasone, made a very strong point that the security of the West was indivisible. Right? And we were talking about Star Wars back then. We were talking about what we now take for granted in ballistic missile systems. But Prime Minister Nakasone was really talking about INF. Why? Because the United States and Russia, Soviets at the time, we're saying, okay, well, we'll pull back these intermediate range nuclear forces from Europe, and we'll put them on the other side of the Soviet Union. Well, who lives on the other side of the Soviet Union but Japan, <laughs> right? So it is basically a, a conversation between the two superpowers that was going to solve a problem in Europe at the expense of our Asian, our allies in Asia. And Japan said, no, thank you. We're not going to accept that. And that was a very powerful beginning of a conversation on the import of this, not only INF, but um, the compromises that the United States might be willing to make that would be detrimental to Japanese interests. Now, the story is somewhat different. Now, it's both conventional and right nuclear. I mean, these, these missiles can do both. Right, they carry both kinds of uh, capabilities. Pr um, President Putin has largely driven the conversation about the INF coming apart because of the capabilities that Russia has been developing. Um, I think you can get two opinions on this. You probably have a, a pretty well-formed opinion yourself <laughs> on whether or not we should have walked out or shouldn't have walked out based on what the Russians were doing. You could make the case on both sides, I think. Um, but the real bug for Asia is China. And Chinese intermediate nuclear forces are not covered under the INF Treaty. Now, I am not naive enough to think, okay, let's have a trilateral treaty <laughs> and everything will be great because the Chinese don't even acknowledge that INF matter. They just don't. They just say it's not a problem. We don't have to talk about it. We're not interested anyway. So that's the real problem for Japan. Um, now, interestingly enough, as you know, the Japan-China relationship has been getting a little bit more in the problem-solving mode and a little bit warmer um, and I think some of the senior bureaucrats from the ministries of foreign affairs from Japan and China at the disarmament, you know, the bureau chiefs of the disarmament have decided they need to have a little bit of a conversation about the possibility of a uh, discussion of INF. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think there's going to, it's, it, it's hard for me to imagine how Japan and China could have an effective treaty of their own. Uh, but it's interesting that it's rising a little bit in the Japan-China relationship at, the, at, the, at a lower level. Reality is, I don't think our government is interested in di disarmament. Right. No, and the, and the conversations between Japan and the United States within an alliance framework just don't seem to be there in a line. Um, they are not there either. Issue. Exactly. So, the, so, so our last nuclear posture review, and again, I don't want to bore you guys all with the nuclear conversations, but you can go back to the Obama era um, 
And there's a kind of dual reaction to the Prague speech. There's a very strong embrace by the Japanese public of Prime Minister, I'm sorry, President Obama's speech in Prague, right, about the responsibility of the nuclear powers also to disarm, right? Not just non-proliferation, but also that. Um, and as you know, there's a very strong Japanese desire for nuclear disarmament, right, for obvious reasons. But for extended, for those who are responsible for planning extended deterrence, meh, there's a little bit of a tricky issue here, which is how do you make sure that there's enough teeth in the American forward deployment to bolster that nuclear umbrella? So that if China does this, or if North Korea does that, then we have a whole arsenal of weapon systems with which we can respond. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the more recent conversation on the, the nuclear posture review incorporated some of the Japanese thinking on exactly what kind of specific weapons they'd like to see uh, us put out in the region. So you hinted at this briefly, uh, but the warming that you described between Japan and China, uh, we're expecting to see a meeting between President Xi and yes. Prime Minister Abe not too long from now. Yes. Um, what do you think will be discussed between the two men when they meet? So it's coming at the G20. It's not a you know bilateral summit. Um, there, the, Mr. Abe went, of course, as you know, last year to Beijing. So it was just a, a Japan-China meeting. This will be in the context of the G20. Um, I suspect Iran, <laughs> just like our Q&A just got, got taken over by the Iran conversation, I suspect that'll be high up there too because the Chinese will want to have that conversation. Uh, I, I suspect there'll be a lot of countries that want the Iran situation to be included in the G20. Um, but then let's leave that out there for a second. And then uh, North Korea. Right. So interesting to me is the extent to which um, some of the conversations at the highest level between the prime minister and the president of China um, have included reference to North Korea. And um, Prime Minister Abe has asked not only President Trump, but also President Xi to help persuade Kim Jong-un to have a meeting with Abe as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think North Korea will be there, obviously. Um, I, the larger context of the Japan-China conversation these days is how can we work together across the region? And this is what I thought was interesting about the, the Prime Minister Abe's tri trip to China, is that I think both governments were trying to find a place where Japan and China might find economic cooperation opportunity together that highlights not necessarily BRI, the Bridge and Road in Initiative by the Chinese, but also highlights the Prime Minister's idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. So why can we find common cause? Can we find a place where we're not at loggerheads, where we may be able to find a, a constructive balance between our visions of what the future of Asia should look like? Mm -hmm. All right, um, so I think we'll open it up for questions now. I think there's a microphone around the room. So uh, just raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And when you do, uh, please wait for the microphone, state your name and affiliation, and please make your questions short and make sure that they're a question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we'll take questions now. Uh, we'll start over there. Can you share your thoughts on Japan's cyber defense capability mm -hmm. in the context of national defense? Thank you. Sure. I will preface that, though, by saying I'm not a cyber expert. Um, what I thought, what I've been watching unfold, just from somebody who's interested broadly in the security um, relationship between our two countries, is two things. One is everybody who's here in New York, especially if you work in a corporation, understand that private sector sourcing of cyber services, right, um, is really very valuable, right? And Japan has been spending quite a lot of time with non-government um, cyber experts in this country, in Israel, in other countries where cyber is seen to be a pretty robust industry. So you see not only Japanese private sector engagement, but also uh, public sector consultations. The Japanese, of course, are getting ready for Tokyo 2020 uh, next year. It is a point of deep concern uh, because, of course, everybody in the world will be going to Tokyo, and um, domestic security in Japan will be of the highest order, obviously, as it is with every country that hosts the Olympics. So there is that preparatory phase as well. So it's not just simply what the two militaries may or may not be doing. The interesting thing, and again, I hear this from people who are experts on cyber, and not so I'm just sharing what I'm hearing, um, is that, in fact, the more robust, forward-leaning, and creative cyber knowledge is not yet in the governments, right? 
It is actually outside of government. And um, that's something that the Japanese government has been persuaded uh, needs to be a priority for them. Uh, but I think our inside government cyber capacities, right? To be quite frank, I guess maybe I shouldn't be too frank. Let me, um, let me try to be diplomatic in my frankness. Um, we've had a lot of hacking, right? Of our government, of our national security agency. Um, there's a lot here that the United States is working on in terms of the fragility, right? Now that doesn't mean that the United States has no cybersecurity, please don't misunderstand me, but there is also different dimensions of this, right, that we, are, we as the United States government continues to grapple with. It's uneven across our governments. And so there is, there is that. If I had to say one final point, and it's not about cyber, it's about security writ large. As you know, the Japanese government under Prime Minister Abe passed the National Secrets Law, which was something that the US government in particular, but also Australia and others, really wanted Japan to upgrade uh, its government security system so that sharing of intelligence and data could be fully protected. Um, there is a push to include Japan in Five Eyes, which are the, the consortium of five countries, mo all English-speaking countries, right? Um, that share intelligence across alliances, right? Um, Huawei, Japan was very quick to make its decision on Huawei, largely for that reason, uh, because the United States government doesn't want its allies to be using Huawei products for the 5G network. Uh, so I think Japan is moving in a direction that it hopes will help to facilitate its er, participation in the Five Eyes intelligence sharing. Great question. I think we covered a lot of important ground with that. Uh, we'll open it up for questions again. Um, we'll go to the gentleman over here on the right. Thank you. My name is Manik Mehta. I'm a journalist. Uh, my question is about Japan's leadership role in the Asia Pacific, given that the US is uh, showing little or no interest at all. That's the feeling you get. Uh, I'll give you the example of the TPP, which was abandoned by President Trump, and Japan took the lead by recreating the CPTPP, which has gone into effect after it was ratified. Uh, what do you think is the feeling in, in Japan about America's leadership role? Is this where I should out some uh, the, the Japanese diplomats in the room? I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think you should be frank. I should be frank, <laughs> diplomatically frank. Um, well, I think there's huge disappointment. With the TPP decision, there's obviously huge disappointment. And there's two reasons for that. Uh, this was an American and Japanese initiative by the end of it, right? And we walked. Um, I am not a fan of President Trump's decision, so I, uh, th those biases must be put on the table. I think it's a huge strategic loss for us. But more importantly, I think it was a huge economic opportunity that we lost as well. Um, and I think what happened at the end of the Obama administration um, is that you know, Obama administration officials began to sell it as strategic leadership when they ought to at home have been selling it as economically good for the United States and they, they couldn't make that case well enough. And as you know, in 2016, both Republican and Democratic um, base, you know, the party members decided that TPP was not good for America economically. So we have, we'll have a long recovery, I think, of how we deal with that here at home in terms of how free trade operates and to whose advantage. Um, but in terms of our leadership, there's another place where I think Prime Minister Abe has been very forward leaning, which is in the creation of the Indo-Pacific uh, vision. And there, we, along with Prime Minister Modi in India, um, they have put a lot of meat on the bones of a, a broad conception for the region that spans two oceans, three continents <laughs> at least, <laughs> maybe another one over there uh, on the eastern and the, on the other side. But, um, but I think this is another place where you see Japan's leadership is not necessarily saying, I'm going to do this, you follow me, but building partnerships and networks and con conceptions of what kind of, of collaborative space there is now, again, at the end of the day, it's all about the free and open Indo-Pacific. It's all about values. 
about what kind of Asia Japan wants to see. And I think regionally sustaining what we now euphemistically refer to as the liberal order, <laughs> um, but creating frameworks for in which free trade, right, economic development, transformation to digital and other kinds of economic uh, transactions, that these things can continue to happen across the region, not just in countries that have advantage. So I think Japan has done a lot lately to offset some of the disadvantages I think we have in the region and beyond. All right, so we're running a little short on time. So do you mind if we take two questions at once? No, 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 and I'll them? try to be snappier. Okay, answers. great. Um, all right, so last questions, unfortunately, but we'll take two from the audience at once, and Sheila will address them consecutively. So we'll start up here. Yeah. Uh, just wait for the microphone, please. It's Fred Katam with Reuters. Hi, Sheila. Um, Ankit asked about Xi and Abe. Will the upcoming G20 summit hosted by Japan, all the tension is going to be on Xi and Trump. As a host nation, what role do you see Japan playing? Is there any possible mediatory role given Japan will seem to be eager to play a role with uh, Iran? This is economic security, I guess. All right, and we'll take one last question from the audience. You can do that. Go to the gentleman right up here in the second row. Uh, I'm Roger McDonald from Revitalization. Um, t the question is, the title of this is Japan Rearmed, uh, the Politics of Military Power. So the question is, over the last 20 years, what has Japan done to be rearmed? Is there a, a, a history or a, a track record to track that? And the second is that domestically in Japan, what are those politics? What are the what are the two or three key issues within Japan domestic politics that um, are being addressed because of this? Okay, let me let me. I'm not quite sure I understood the second part, but let me um, start with Xi and uh, Trump and the G20. Um, the interesting thing, I think, I don't know how much Iran is going to overshadow everything, right? I mean, it depends on what happens at the UN Security Council. It depends on what happens the next couple of days. So it, it becomes a little harder to think about G20. But, um, but sure, I think, you know, a trade war between the United States and China sooner or later is going to impact negatively on Japanese interests. I think that to the extent that Abe wants to shape Trump's thinking, it will be on the commonalities, IPR protections, right? The kinds of structural issues, the imbalance, not of the deficit, the trading you know, imbalance, but of the way in which people are constrained by, in doing business within China. So I think there's a lot of common ground there between Tokyo and Washington on this, and between Japanese and American private sectors. I think there's a lot more common ground than you might, uh, you know, of course, Fred, but that we, we, we often get into the strategic mindset and we forget that there are some common things. Things like CFIUS, um, which is you know, making sure that China is not purchasing critical technologies and resources, right? Um, that kind of thing. So we have a lot of, we have a pretty vibrant and robust, is the word in Washington, robust policy conversation on the practices by the Chinese that are really undercutting competitiveness that are really also have this national security concern for both of our countries. And I think there's a lot of common ground. Nonetheless, the trade, you know, the, the, the costs of this tariff war are huge. Now, they haven't necessarily been huge for the global economy yet, but they're, they're getting there, right? They're beginning to feel the ripple effects, and if you combine that with the Iran tensions, right, the downturn in the global economy could be severe, and Japan and the whole G20 conversation will be about that, I suspect. Nonetheless, I don't think Abe, Prime Minister Abe is in a position to tell President Trump to stop. If he had that kind of influence on the president, we would be in TPP right now, right? I mean, this is just not what the president, the president is running up $25 billion in subsidies to our agricultural sector. We are getting hurt. Sectors of our economy are getting hurt. Um, and I don't think Mr. Abe is gonna change that basic point of view. I think implicit in your question, and maybe you didn't mean it this way, but I'll take it this way, just because it's the summer of 2019, is the bilateral US-Japan trade talks. <laughs> 
Now there are other people who can speak much more cogently than I on how that's going to come out, but there is frustration in the Trump administration. Uh, ambassador Haggerty, our ambassador in Tokyo, made that very clear statement today or yesterday, Tokyo time, about the president is frustrated with the delay in the bilateral trade talks. And if you may remember that when President Trump went to Tokyo and had that lovely you know, three, four day long extravaganza that included the imperial, the new emperor and empress, right? Um, he was quite, you know, along the way, pointed in his references to the lack of a trade agreement and the continued deficit. So I think under, under, underneath here is what I worry a little bit about is that China, he may just say, okay, fine, we're gonna continue with China, but let's get a little bit more concessions out of Japan on the agricultural sector to make the farmers happier. There may be some spillover effects in the bilateral trade talks that will be hard for Mr. Abe to manage, especially with the election coming up. Long-winded answer, I'm not sure I did that justice. But so I, I can't, in, in the last five minutes, give you the full book. Can they let you buy the book? <laughs> but but I, I think to, to be fair, Domestic politics in Japan obviously have revolved around how to interpret Article 9. Um, I, I use the phrase the Japanese themselves use over the course of many chapters on some of these issues. I, I do a deep dive on a lot of the domestic politics and why and how they shape specific debates. The political interpretation of Article 9 manifests itself in the policy over military um, in the form of what hadome, the brakes, like the brakes of a car. Hadome means breaks, right? And how that is interpreted over time has changed in a sweeping way. So you go back to the 50s and 60s, it was about what kind of weaponry? Offensive, defensive, do they have bombing sites? Do they have this capability? Do they have huge diet debates about the specs of a aircraft, things like that. Zero now, zero. F-35s, F-35As, Bs, doesn't matter what kind of sophisticated capability, not a problem. 70s, 80s, you move into missions. What kind of missions will the self-defense forces do? Can't do anything unless it's narrowly construed as territorial defense. Now, security of Japan, not a geographical concept at all, right? Gulf of Aden, anti-piracy, important for the security of Japan. Doesn't happen anywhere near Japanese territory, right? So these ways of defining politically what kind of limits need to be imposed on military and the use of the military have gradually transformed over time. That's kind of the story of the book. So how to limit, what limitations are implicit in the Constitution, but what are really to keep the military from doing things it ought not to do. So that's one. The second is the balance of political power in Japan. And I think you know, for, for people who are not watching Japanese politics every day like some of us, <laughs> um, the fact is Mr. Abe has a two-thirds majority in the lower house of parliament, which for those of you who know parliamentary systems, he can set the legislative agenda. Um, and since the last upper house election, he's had more or less, if not a two-thirds majority, at least people with affinity have been largely a two-thirds majority in the upper house. Very unusual in post-war politics. So the election that's coming in July is an upper house election, and it's not clear that that will continue. But he's had a lot of latitude because the LDP and its partners have been very, very strong electorally. And it's allowed them to do difficult things where other leaders couldn't, even if they wanted to, couldn't have gotten it done in my view. So there's a couple of more themes, but we're out of time. But those are the two big picture kinds of things is what can you get done? Uh, what do you have the political foundation for getting done? And there are several prime ministers along the way that have had more capability than others politically to move the needle. All right, thank you so much, Sheila. And I will note that the subtitle of the book is The Politics of Military Power, so it really does delve into those questions. And I'll just say, I thought that the description of Japan's kind of the hermeneutics of Article 9, uh, I thought was just excellent. Uh, I definitely learned a lot that I didn't know about the constitutional debates in Japan. So again, Japan rearmed, and I invite everybody to thank Sheila Smith. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.